So I'm thrilled to welcome Jill to the stage. She is a Stop Pilates certified instructor, fascia release and movement instructor, a functional medicine health coach, shout out to FMCA. She has an additional training for injury and special populations, pre postnatal Pilates for golf and athletic conditioning, a whole background in fascia release, and then Halo certified. And there's a lot of certifications in there, Jill, as well. So we're going to pop you into the stage and then I'm going to remove the background. Hello. Good morning. Well, morning here. <laughs> Oh, it's it's definitely a morning here too. So it's still morning for all of us. Oh, I'm so excited to be here with you guys today. We've been, you know, chit-chatting online for a while. So it's it's nice to e-meet you. Yes, definitely. Please let all our fibromyalgia friends out there know where you're streaming in from. I am streaming in from Denver, Colorado. Where the sun is shining, there's a, a strange light coming in. So excuse me for that. <laughs> well, I know that some That's people, great. some of our fibromyalgia friends are now getting snow. So there's been snowfall on the other side of the country, except not where Danielle is at, but and not where we're at. So we'll just, we're a little bit warmer in temperatures for us. And those of you out there who are getting snow, please stay warm. <laughs> well, I'm excited to have you here. I know this is going to be something new and different to do a live demo um, for us to kind of talk about the fascia yes. um, yeah. and the science of a little bit of in-depth. And boy, do I need to do this this morning yeah. because, well, I smell like eucalyptus rub and all <laughs> kinds. Of, I'm glad we're virtual, not in person. <laughs> so I'll let you lead, Jill, and take it away. Okay, well, let's let's chat a little bit about the fascia. I'm sure you too have read up quite a bit on it. For for people that don't know about fascia, it's a connective tissue. It goes around every single muscle fiber, mus muscle bundle, tendon, ligament, nerve, organ. It is completely connected in our body. There isn't a place it breaks up, and it has more nerve endings than any other part in our body, 250 million. So it's our largest sensory organ. And, you know, healthy fascia should move with us. If you look at it under a microscope, it's spacious and airy and well-organized. Now, what happens through stress, trauma, injury, and what the studies have shown with people with fibromyalgia is that the fascia gets almost thick and dense. And it can create like a lesion or a, a knot. And when that happens, it restricts blood flow and oxygen. It restricts the mobility. Think of it almost as like a straight jacket. The muscle underneath it can no longer fully contract and release. So we even lose strength and it can create a lot of pain. There tends to be a lot of hot spots and sensitivities and people with fibromyalgia where they tend to get some of these sensitivities are big fire, um, fascia spots, gathering spots. So often, you know, as you're doing some of this fascia release, if it's incredibly painful where you're on, if you just kind of move off a little bit from that spot, um, you can target those areas kind of working from around and, and in to help release it. The goal is to rehydrate it, to smooth it back out and um, to create less pain for the fibro community. Well, I, I do hear that it causes a great amount of pain. So, and it, it's everywhere around the body, correct? That's right. That's right. So even your diaphragm. So here's an interesting, what do we do when we're in pain, right? We kind of huddle in, we tighten up, we want to like wrap ourselves around our body almost, which again is tightening your fascia. But, you know, you can meditate for hours a day, but if the fascia around your diaphragm is stuck, that diaphragm, so right when we inhale, our diaphragm should press down, which allows our belly to expand, but then it also allows our lungs to be able to breathe and move three-dimensionally within our rib cage. That's what your breath should feel like. But if the fascia around our diaphragm is stuck and it can't travel down, where does our breath get redirected? Up here, oh, my neck and shoulders are really tight. Oh, really? <laughs> and that alone creates more stress. That produces more stress hormones in the body. So, you know, even be able to just release the diaphragm and to be able to breathe. You know, there's nothing more frustrating when this is stuck and you can't take a deep breath. And everyone keeps telling you, take some deep breaths, relax. <laughs> it creates more anxiety, right? Like, I, I just can't get air. Well, that's why. 
So um, even, yeah, I mean, everything, everyone just thinks the fascia work is around muscles, but even, you know, through the diaphragm, through the organs is super important. Well, and breath work is, is definitely important for all of us. And many of us, cause we're holding or, you know, we hold our shoulders, you'll see us hunched. Uh, I've heard your interview, which we're going to share out with everybody too, uh, with Dr. Ron, mm -hmm. where you're talking about the importance of posture and movement yes. with that, because, oh, uh, Right now, I, I, I'm feeling exactly everything that you're saying right now. Yeah, and it's true. It is impossible to have good posture. It is impossible to have a strong core if you're not breathing correctly. So I'll have that. Even, you know, people that come in with diastasis after pregnancy and their, you know, abdominal split. Like, what can I do for my core? I'm doing, you know, five minute planks and 100 crunches a day. I'm like, awesome. You are exasperating it. You're making it. You know, the, the breathing fully and deeply and connecting with the proper core muscles, the diaphragm pushing down into the transverses, that alone strengthens the core. So there's no way to have that good posture and that connection into your core if you're unable to take a full breath and if you're not breathing properly. Because like you said, you you know, you start coming up here and then all of a sudden all the fascia in your chest gets really tight, right? And then our shoulders round forward. It pulls our head forward and then our neck hurts, our shoulders hurt in between our shoulder blades, right? All those spots that sound familiar. <laughs> yeah, everything you're saying, I'm like, yes, I, I have problems with the breathing and everything in my neck. And yeah. I've had a myofascial massage. It's the only type of massage I can get because if I get like a deep tissue massage the next day, I'm like, no, too much pain. Yeah, you know, and that's what I love about this work is I will guide people through it, but it's empowering others to heal themselves and to controlling not only, okay, so let's say it's, you're controlling the amount of pressure, whether you're using one of our soft balls, which a lot of people in the fibro community need to start with just to get the initial superficial layers to release and hydrate before you're even able to go any deeper. Um, but you're able to control the amount of pressure you want to give exactly where you want to be with that pressure and how long you want to stay there. That's one. And then another thing I like to point out to people, I, I know I've had this experience where, you know, I might be stressed or upset about something and I go to get some body work and the vibe of either the person or just the space or sounds from outside, like I can't relax. Yeah. So the fact that you're able to do this in your own home, you can play your favorite music, get your favorite aromatherapy going, let everybody know, just give you that space and you can do it at five in the morning, if you're awake, you can do it before you go to bed. You don't have to schedule these appointments when, you know, you like it, you look at your day book that like, okay, I can get in two weeks. Sure. But you might not be having a good day that day. It might not be the best time for you to really be present with your breath and to be able to let go. So I just feel like it, it really helps speed up the process because you can do it whenever and however long you want as well. Are there areas for fibromyalgia in particular? Because a lot of us, uh, the mobility is quite a challenge. Um, as you mentioned, there's pain elements too, especially when we breathe. So when getting started with this type of modality, we're talking about the fascia. Wh where would you recommend we begin? Well, I will first and foremost say the, the diaphragm for everybody. It it's, it's just has to be step one. Um, and... I often find like the chest and the pecs step two. And I have three different ways to address the pecs because if I give somebody with fibromyalgia or it's just super tender there, um, something that I might give someone that's more open, they're going to be really sore the next day. They're not going to want to do it again. So I, you know, again, kind of have that soft approach. But the other interesting thing is, let's say even the softest of versions bother somebody with fibromyalgia that day on the chest. It's just that area. You can move to the back. You can move to the foot because again, ultimately the whole system is connected. So if I have somebody that has a headache, for example, I say, okay, we're going to start by rolling your feet. And they're like, no, my head. I'm like, yep, your feet, because you have a fascia line that goes from the bottom of the feet clear up to the back top of the head. And so when the feet are tight, it can tug on that whole chain. I, if when someone has like low back pain or their hamstrings are really tight, I'll have them try to touch their toes and, you know, their back grabs or, you know, they can't get very far. 
And then we roll your feet and all of a sudden they can go down four more inches. It, it increases the immobility that much. So I would say it's really individual and the importance of playing around. And I always, I have a lot of uh, perfectionists I'll do this work with and they're afraid they're not on the right spot. And I'm like, you, you can really roll anywhere that feels good to you. There's only a few things you can do wrong. One, be on a place where it is too intense and you're holding your breath and bracing rather than connecting with the tissue in your breath and getting it to relax. Sometimes people are like, no, I just want to get the most out of it. I'm going to go deeper. I'm like, you're actually defeating the purpose because everything's bracing even more, right? That's like so 1980s, so like no pain, no gain, right? No pain, all gain in my book. So you get to those areas and just try to soften and relax. So again, that's going to be different for everybody. The other thing is, you know, as you're doing some of this work and you're rolling, some people, rather than kind of focusing on their breath and bringing their mind to the tissue, telling it to let go, like, okay, I got to roll this out because then I got to answer some work emails and then I got to make some lunch and then I got to do this. And again, they're going so fast that their tissues never have a chance to release. So they're bracing. So that's really the only thing you can do wrong. I always tell people explore. Um, the last little part is if you have any in, um, impinged nerves, if so, a lot of people with um, maybe sciatica, you know, if you're on a spot where you feel a zing, you might be on that nerve and you don't want to be there. But if you just move an inch off of that, because that fascia around that area is going to be tight. If you move an inch off of it and get that nerve zing gone, start loosening up the fascia around there, it'll help um, release some of that as well. I hope that answered your question. It does. And just unpacking, there was so much to what you said and even these talking points. Let's just rewind a second. So top of the head connected to the foot. So if there's stuff going on, like in the back of the head, I potentially should be addressing the bottom of my foot. You can. Instead. Yeah. And it's not necessarily instead. You can still do some of the neck stuff. Okay. Or if that feels good, like even sometimes I have a headache and I'll just like dig this into my temple and it feels so great. But also if I'm on a phone call and I'm, if I roll my feet, that'll also help it. So, and it'll, it just depends. It's unique for everybody. So yeah, absolutely though. You can start with your, you feel a headache. Well, and I know that this can be intimidating because we're talking about touch for some people. It's like the hypersensitivity, allodynia. And this is going to be a theme for today too with later and how to experience this and gently like move into it and layer it uh, moving. Because I know conversations come up a lot about costochondritis. So what you said in here, a lot of us are diagnosed with that, the, all this tension and pulling in and pain. I, I think a lot of the fibromyalgia friends, and if you are one of them, you can feel it all in your face, your neck, your back. Um, yeah. And so again, you know, I've, um, I was teaching a workshop in Houston not long ago, and I had a couple um, women with fibromyalgia in the group. And so for example, when I had most of the group using this ball to kind of sink into to open the pec, that's too much, even though that's what's so nice about these balls. First of all, a tennis ball isn't designed to absorb our weight, right? It's, it's not. And lacrosse balls and some of the other balls, they're like hard and they're plastic and they're just awful. I'm like, when I see people using those, I'm like, do you not love yourself? <laughs> it just looks painful. So these have a little bit more of a give. So they're a little bit nicer and they have a grip, right? So a lot of the work I'll do too with fibromyalgia uh, community is work on just hydrating the superficial tissue. So even just taking that ball and giving it like a twist on your skin it gathers that tissue and hydrates it. And again, you can push deep and twist, or you can just go really light at first. So that's okay. that grippy sensation is, is really beneficial for that work, which obviously a slick ball doesn't have, or like a fuzzy tennis ball doesn't have. So that, that there's purpose to that design. But the inflatable ball, the sphere, Sometimes I'll just have, you know, people with the fibro group, like I said, with that pec, just lean into that and focus on breathing because it's not a lot of pressure. Again, I don't blow this up until it's ready to pop. It has a little bit of give and you can play with it. And for my extra, extra sensitive people, sometimes rather than lying on the ball, like even just holding it there and imagine filling the ball up with air as you inhale is a nice introduction before say leaning into the wall with that and applying more pressure. So 
there's little baby steps that that you can gradually do to build up to that work. Well, and I know I see the questions coming in because there's a lot of like, how do we do this? Okay, so that's why we brought Jill on to do, <laughs> to do some of these live demos. But we, we definitely have to start with explaining more of the orbs. So we we want to give, a, we'll be giving away these orbs um, too as part throughout the conference. I don't want to touch anything right now on my computer to <laughs> set up the giveaway after we're going to get through this interview first. Um, but these orbs are being, you have them for sale and you also have clients classes too for more advanced instruction on what to do. But if someone wanted to get started, because we're going to be like talking about this a lot too, we're let, let's get started showing some people some spaces or demos. Should we go into the face? I don't know, Danielle, what I am a mess this morning. So maybe Danielle <laughs> will pick because I always have a spot up here or in the back. So where should we begin, Jill? Oh, man. Okay. Yeah, let's get going. Um, Okay, well, since you mentioned mentioned the face and it doesn't require us moving, let's let's start with that. So grab your mini orb, the small one. Okay. And yeah, tension in the face, TMJ, clenching, grinding, eh, all that stuff. This is a simple, simple one you can do. And I'm sorry, the sun is just blinding. Okay. I'm trying to find the best way where it's not, but I don't just don't have it today. Okay. <laughs> so you're gonna basically be taking this ball from your jaw and you're going to be again with as much pressure as you want plowing grabbing and sliding it up now as you do that we'll start here back at the hairline you're going to pull your bottom jaw down in opposition so we start to slide it up and then pull the bottom jaw down and keep sliding that ball up and we're going to do about four passes so we're starting back here and now we're going to come a little further forward towards the mouth towards the jaw and then slide and start to pull the bottom jaw down. Good. We'll do two more coming a little further towards the mouth, little plow. Good. And do one more, a little closer to the mouth, plow it in and pull. Yeah. How'd that feel? The pressure okay for you? Well, yeah. I like that we can control our own pressure. Yeah. Yeah. And again, if you find that, oh, you know, on that third spot right here, and then you, I mean, you could even just, you know, spend a little extra time there. If you've ever had a myofascial massage or any massage, sometimes they scan over that part, like, no, but go back. No, but go back again and <laughs> go back again. You get to do that. Right. So let's try the other side too. Oh, dig it in. Now yeah. I have to get court. The thing is, you have to be coordinated a little <laughs> <laughs> and then pull the bottom jaw down. Yeah, that's it. Good. And again. Good. Dig it in and really pull that bottom jaw down as much as you can. Oh, wow, that. You found a spot. <laughs> this too, I've had um, actor Dr. Ron, when he does this work, it always releases his sinuses. <laughs> but now if you open your jaw, feel how it just kind of falls open a little easier? Oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> my, my jaw was like hurting really bad the past two days. So oh. that's crazy. Yeah. I mean, that's what's, it's super simple and subtle and sometimes like i always yeah. do these check-ins with people because like oh yeah that felt nice but then you do a check-in and yeah. you're like oh whoa that that's a lot different i have a glute release that i do with people that it's the same thing it's like they do they do it and then like open their knee and their hip just has a huge amount of range of motion but um yeah, we can. Let's see. What do I want to do with you guys next? Let's well, and I wanted to say too that this is much better. I will say this is much better than rubbing a tennis ball up against your face. Yeah. So please yeah. don't do that if anyone's thinking because <laughs> yeah. I've I tried it before. 
I used the racquetball, so that was Oh, cool. yeah, yeah. But yeah, do you notice this has like a little tiny bit of give and then it kind of comes yeah. in support. So you it's safe in like all your bony landmarks and everything. Yeah. It feels much better. And then again, just to emphasize the difference, because some of us that have experienced yeah. a myofascial like massage, so mm -hmm. it's really hard because I know you have to find the right person if you're going to do that. And I am particularly sensitive. So this is nice because you can try the pressure and you can control it on yourself as opposed to someone else because for many of us if they hit the wrong zone because everybody always asks please let me know if i if it hurts but unfortunately once it hurts then yes. you're already in pain so this is a good tool for us to be able to use at home in order to manage things at our own pace and our own strength. That's exactly it. And, you know, sometimes getting into some of these spots. So, you know, some of my series, you're, you're rolling like we did. Sometimes like, um, you know, you're just letting the ball set, let's say in the glute, for example, and you can kind of squeeze the glute muscle for a minute so that you can let it really relax and sink. And there's so many layers of muscle there that if you just hold still and breathe, if you can just start to let it go and let it go a little more and let it go a little more. So just sitting there with it, you don't even have to move and just getting those again to say, you know, it's okay, you can let go. You're in a safe place. You're not in pain right now. And again, if that spot's too much, you just move in an inch and it might be the perfect place for you to be able to relax. Yep, and you're not going. You can do it at home. You could be in your pajamas. Yeah, you, you can feel comfortable with them. So, you know, all of my clients now, they are, they're always in the suitcase. Some of them will use them on the airplane. I use the um, oh, max at the QL, um, you know, that kind of muscle between the pelvis and the rib cage. And you just can kind of roll it a little side to side, kind of tuck and tilt your pelvis a little, and it will release your back and that strain you might get in kind of the sacrum area when you're sitting for a long time. And to, nobody even knows, you know, <laughs> you're yeah. just sitting, rocking around a little bit. Sitting like during a conference for too long where we need better chairs. <laughs> <laughs> yes, ladies. Well, and so if you're sitting too long, what do you think about rolling your feet? We've got some time, right? You want to roll your feet? You want to go through that series? Yeah. Okay. So I like to do the standing up because I like to apply more pressure. Again, you can, you're on one foot, so you don't have to, but I also work with people with neuropathy and things like that, and they prefer sitting down. So that's okay too. You guys do whatever you want. I'm going to stand up so I'm, I can point the screen down so people can see what I'm doing with my feet. Does that sound good? Yep. Yeah, that sounds good. Okay. And we'll definitely be including links to the orbs yeah. um, as well. So I'm just going to include a link to Jill's website where she has classes available. You you do do in-person classes too for anyone so that is. I do, yeah, I do in-person and virtual classes and private sessions. And I'm also going to offer two specials for your community. So we'll, we can set, um, give that information out later too. Wonderful. And I was going to ask like for scar tissue, if you have like surgery, in their scar tissue like how does it work with the fascia it's basically the same thing scar okay. tissue is like a buildup of that so okay. it's the same thing and i mean it's one thing that that tends to drive me crazy so once <laughs> the tissues heal right the scar tissue the the fascia because it's really crazy if you were to look at someone's forearm under a microscope, look at their fascia. Again, it almost looks like a spider web. If you were to look at that fascia after being in a cast for six weeks, it's like a cement wall. So, and people go into strengthening it right away, right? Like once the tissues heal, they go into strengthening it. Well, again, it's not going to have the full mobility. It's not going to have the full ability to contract and release. So it's not going to get the strength. It's not going to have the range of motion. So it has to be released first. That's what I do with all of my clients. And it's and it's nice because again, it gives them freedom and range of motion. There's nothing worse when you have that restriction. You're just playing tug of war with your body then, right? Yeah. <clears throat> okay, so let's roll our feet. <laughs> okay. All right. So everyone gets us, luckily my feet are, I think they're clean today. All right, so again, you can do it standing or sitting, but I'm gonna put it right in front of my heel a little bit. And I'm just gonna push down again with as much pressure as you're comfortable with. Good. And then I'm gonna slide it up a little bit mid arch. And same thing, just put a shing down with as much as you're comfortable with. Good. 
And then we're gonna slide it up just a little bit more. And we're gonna press down. Good. And then what we're gonna do, so with we're gonna go from the big toe to the heel and with consistent pressure. So again, only as much as you want, but keep it consistent. You're gonna plow a line slowly towards your heel. I will say you can never go too slow, you can only go too fast. So there's that nice smooth pressure. You might feel some snap, crackle, pops. And then slowly back towards the big toe. Now I feel the spot that's like exactly where. And so if you get to one of those spots, again, where it feels tender, you can hang out there. You can even almost do like a little bit of a bounce like that. Oh. Yeah. That again, it's like pushing on a sponge. The yeah. more you ever push on a sponge and then it can like absorb more fluid, right? So that's the other thing too. It's allow you can drink water, but if the fascia is not ready to absorb any of that liquid, it becomes basically like almost wastewater outside of our tissue. So if we can open those tissues up, it's going to allow for more hydration in. Now we're going to go from the middle toe to the heel with as much pressure as you want. Just keep it smooth. and slowly pressing down and back up. And we'll do that one more time. Good. And then last pass, I'm gonna take it from my little toe to my heel and same thing. Just nice, slow, smooth pressure. So again, you can sit, watch a movie. Yeah. And, you know, I have clients that I can't get to do anything else. They'll keep a ball under their desk at work and roll their feet out while they're at work. So that's always an option too. And if you do stand, is it okay to hold on to something as well? Absolutely, yep. Now, if you're able to, just walk around a little bit and you'll see how different that foot feels to the other. Yeah, go ahead and take a little walk about, Danielle. <laughs> <laughs> we, we're a live broadcast everybody this is live demo so yeah. <laughs> we, we're not we're doing this live and i was trying it on the floor and my orb ran away from me so I, I can't move <laughs> so, <laughs> it's fine How's i'm reporting fine? back well, it's feels great it definitely feels different yeah which yeah. is crazy because that's my bad leg. i did it on my bad like my leg like gets worse so yeah definitely interesting yeah, yeah it almost like flattens out right yeah. yeah yeah that is exactly what it feels like you know one example i get, i like to give to people too right we have three hamstrings right the back of our leg it connects near our sits bones like attaches the tendons at the knee i'll do a series where we kind of roll in between those three hamstrings and what people discover is that you know well if when that fascia is loose those hamstrings can move independently and what tends to happen though when the fascia gets tightened it kind of bonds in and builds one what i call one mega hamstring and when that happens it starts to tug on the low back so if you see people that kind of like you know sit back here yeah. that's generally what's going on and they'll go to stretch their hamstring out and they, they keep tucking like that. So they're not even getting that separation of the hamstrings from the low back. So you, I'll do that with people and then they'll sit and feel the difference. And the one side just feels like totally flattened and, and almost like puffier. But again, then you're able to use those three hamstrings as they're supposed, as they're designed to be used, which is kind of cool. Yeah, that's, uh, this is like so amazing. I'm so excited to be doing this. <laughs> good, good. <laughs> We're doing this live and this just all connects back to pain because people don't realize with all of it, as you mentioned, it's trying to hydrate this or pull it out because if we're all hunched over just naturally, because that's seems to be scientifically what many of us do when we're in chronic pain because we're trying to protect our system or just we it's in here so it causes so many problems 
jobs and just even how we might mitigate movement um, and aspects of that, like using the restroom, we might alter how we do things, how we walk. So it amplifies even more and creates a lot more pain. So it's really important that we release this. Right. And, you know, here's something simple. So, you know, I talk about this. I talked about this in my um, talk with Dr. Ron, too. But what does your dog or cat do when they get up from a nap? Right. They stretch. And what that's doing is it's resetting the fascia there. My, my little boy does it too. He moves around a bit. I see him stretching. Now, that again, that movement just resets the fascia line when we're tight. So this is also similar to people that might have arthritis is the shrink and the, the movement becomes here, right? And it's, we want to be able to lengthen out beyond that, to stretch those lines out. And um, I know, Melissa, you had asked me a little bit about like stretching and things we can do when we're stretching. It's not a stagnant stretch that we need. It's just challenging and changing those fascia lines. So like even a baseball pitcher, right? Big range of motion here, right? But this is the only range of motion they're doing. So it builds up a fascia wall this way, (laughs) right? So for them, you know, doing movements like this is going to help keep that fascia active and healthy. So one thing I tell people who are sitting like you guys are doing this weekend, you're sitting in a chair. I'm sorry, I need my camera crew you know, just randomly doing things where, again, if you're in pain, we tend to not really want to. But if you're not pushing against resistance and you're just feeling a little more opposition, a little opposition, a little opposition, you know, just think of moving almost like you're doing a slow chair dance, you know, think of seaweed in the ocean. Mm. All of that stuff will be really, really helpful, Um, more so than even just holding a a stretch that might feel really uncomfortable, if that makes sense. Yeah. So when you do the, um, like if I were to watch TV and do it on my foot, like, can I do it for 30 minutes? Or is that like my fascia is like, no. No, if if it doesn't hurt, you know, if something is super tender, you know, obviously that means it's an area we kind of need it, right? Um, But you don't want to go, too big. Just be gentle with it. And the next day, you know, if, if it's not sore, then you can go deeper and longer. But if you're rolling your feet, you're like, wow, this just feels really good. You're not going to, you're not going to hurt your fascia at all. Right. So yeah, go for it. If it feels, if it feels good. That's the thing. It's funny. I, when I start working with people, I'm like, okay, just try to commit to like doing at least just you know, even if it's just five or 10 minutes of one rollout a day, but they're like, oh my God, I did it five times, the full body in one day. It felt so good. I'm like, okay, well, if it, if it feels good. And yeah. I, I will say the other thing about this. So, you know, you notice Danielle, like when you walked up or both of you, when you did the jaw and it released, you will have that like instant improvement in mobility and relief, but the work is really accumulative. So, I had been a a professional dancer and when I retired, it was like, I just, I couldn't stretch enough. You know, it was just like, no matter what I did, I'd spend an hour stretching. I'd still feel tight. Well, of course, because the fascia around it was tight. So it would just pull it all back. Right. When I started rolling, it was like, okay, I didn't have that feel that need to stretch as much. But if I were to start, like, think about where I was day one of my stretch of my fascia rolling and fast forward a year later, I felt like I had a completely different body, like my breath, my posture, just my ability to move. And, you you know, you can see it when you see people walking, you know, like some people move and they see pretty free in their bodies. And some people, you, know, you see them walk and it's like they've never moved from this position at all. And the, this work is accumulative. So if you start rolling and do a little bit every day, I promise you within a year, I'm, again, you'll feel differences right away, but in a year, you're going to be like, wow, my body just feels more free is generally the feedback I get from people. I felt locked in my body. Now I feel free, which is pretty cool. Okay. okay. So we can start with go slow, build up, but it, it's going to vary from each person. 
Yeah, yeah. There's there's not a right or wrong way to do it. Do what feels good. The goal is, again, to empower you to heal yourself. And nobody knows your body and your your pain and your current energy that day better than you, right? So if you can commit, you know, again, just a small amount of time at first, I'm going to dedicate five minutes in the morning and five minutes before I go to bed to just rolling something out. Generally, people will end up going a lot more than that. But <laughs> if you can just commit to that little bit, you don't have to fold yourself in a weird position. The work isn't exhausting. You won't you know, wear yourself out. So it, it's something that's generally pretty easy and people look forward to. To committing to. Well, yeah, I'm going to have everybody hold me it. accountable. <laughs> I know. I think Danielle and I will hold each other accountable. Yeah. yeah. It's always going to have accountability, buddy. <laughs> I'm going to text and be like, did you, did you do your fashion release today? <laughs> I just have to make sure my dog doesn't steal the orbs. He is obsessed. Yes, yes, no, it's so true. Now I, all my clients, it's really funny you say that they have like sets now in their purse on their nightstand and at work because dogs, kids, I'll find them fun to play with. <laughs> well, and Marco is here. I wanted to just say, I guess he says he gives, well, this is a fun way to do stretches is he gives funny names to these stretches. Uh -huh. So the Tonka Mont, the hula. Have you ever given funny names? This might be a creative <laughs> way to get people to move more. I love it. Well, it's so funny. I'm like, I don't know if I should share the name that so many of my clients have given to the one where you lie on your bed. So again, my favorite one, I'm going to show this really quick. If anybody ends up getting gorgeous ball, one of the best ways to start being able to release your diaphragm is to place the ball. So right here's the bottom of my ribs kind of goes under there. Place the ball there and just breathe into the ball. And every time you exhale, you're trying to relax your back ribs and relax your shoulders. What many of my clients have called that one is the barfing frog. <laughs> <laughs> I don't recommend doing it after you've eaten. And it is incredibly uncomfortable the first couple of times you do it if your diaphragm is stuck. But before long, you'll actually crave it. When you, when you feel your breath going into those areas you know it's not supposed to be, you're going to actually crave it. But since I showed that one and since I said releasing the diaphragm is so important, I do want to give you the step one if that one's too intense, which is all you have to do is lie with the ball diaphragm here and you let your arms, I just interlace my fingers, I let my arms be dead weight. And as I inhale, rather than letting the ball rise up with my breath, I let my arms stay heavy into it. So as I inhale, my belly has to kind of press into it. I hold that inhale for a moment. And then as I exhale, I let the ball help the diaphragm fall and sink a little bit deeper. So that is a good uh, initiation into the barfing frog. <laughs> That but was, I think of a more fun name that makes people want to try it. <laughs> I, I think that is a fun name right there. So I, I think you might have to brainstorm more with Marco. Yeah, Marco. Thank you for that. <laughs> I know Francis was wondering about exercise for upper and mid back, but is, are there different ones? Are they the same? Can you hit both? Like all uh, There's a whole bunch, I, but there's a whole bunch for the upper, a bunch of different funky ones. But I'm going to show you the one for the mid back. Because again, if you've been in pain and you're here, and you're, it's like you build this hard tortoise shell, right? In the middle of the back. And for me, so I was born really lordotic, meaning that my lower back had a really big curve like that, which created all sorts of problems. But when that happens, what your body does to counterbalance that is this, right? And I was asthmatic as a kid. So the role that I had to do every day that changed my posture and my breathing is the one I'm about to show you for the mid back, that and the barfing frog. So <laughs> what you would do is you would take the two mini orbs and they come in that net bag, right? So you put them in there, you tighten the bag up. And again, there's not a right or wrong place. You can go and do this completely down your spine. But for what we're talking about today, I'm going to start with them kind of up near like the top of my shoulder blade. So not in my neck, but up through here. What you do 
is you can place those balls down. And if lying on the floor is uncomfortable for you or it's too much pressure, you can also do this against the wall. But you place yourself on those balls and you just move your arms around a little bit. So you can open, you can give yourself a hug. See how that feels? I like to do these little kind of scrubs up and down. You can also kind of roll side to side. You can also go-go dance. There you go, Marco. That's a good one. Go-go dance. Go dance. <laughs> and then what you would do is you lift your head up a little, use your feet, and just push all down one joint, and you lower back down. And again, moving your arms around in any of those patterns. But you basically move joint by joint by joint down the spine. So it gets right in there where a foam roller is a little more broad. This is really getting around each of those joints in your spine. So all the way down the thoracic moving. There's no, again, no right or wrong way to move your arms. Do what feels good. If you have a tight lower back, you can do that too. Obviously you don't need to move the arms around anymore. What feels good once you get into like the bottom of the ribs or the lower back is just kind of tucking and tilting. I'm exaggerating so you can really see what I'm doing, but tucking and tilting your pelvis a little and just kind of rocking it a little that way. That'll help that part of the spine. But that for me, that was my everydayer. And I will say like when I first started it, it was like I was lying on like rocks in certain places. It was so tight for me. Now, when I go to lie on these balls, it's like I don't even realize they're there. I barely feel them. So if it is tense, I do promise you it will relax. But again, if you do it against the wall with your knees bent, you can lean back a lot. You can lean back a little. You can do those little scrubs. You can kind of squeeze the shoulders together and that'll target it as well. Well, we appreciate all this information. Danielle, do you have any additional questions before I go to my other one that Jill knows that I'm going to ask her about? I just, I have it up against my low back. I'm like doing the, <laughs> sitting in the chair right now and it feels great. So good. good. Oh, good. I'm glad it, 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 I, it, Danielle's been tremendous in doing all this. So any way we can support her right now to get some relief, go at it. This is how <laughs> I'm doing it live. Um, well, Jill, one of the questions because of your background with Pilates, and there is a lot of fibromyalgia research that says there's benefit to it, but it's so challenging. It looks really intimidating because all of the images I see online, I'm like, I'm going to fall or I don't know. It's just, it sounds really intimidating. So when these studies come out that fibromyalgia, you know, people can get a lot of benefit. What is, what, what do we do? Like, where do we start with some of us that are a little bit more clumsy and no, it's, no, it's so funny. I, everyone that always comes into Pilates are like, I have to be your worst student ever. I'm like every single person says that because it's like learning a new language you're not working your big primary muscle movers. You're working those small, subtle stabilizers. You can't power your way through. I have this one, and I'm sorry for all the men listening in, but I have this one simple little exercise that I do with all my men that they, the minute they come in to say, just to show like, leave your humility at the door. You're not gonna power muscle your way through it. It is the subtlety and softness. So, and also I will say to you personally, Melissa, people are putting on pictures of them doing the crazy stuff. There is a lot of very simple <laughs> movements, closed chain movements where you're in a safe place. I also wanna really recommend looking for a well-trained instructor Unfortunately, like all things, there's a lot of studios doing weekend certifications now and, and things like that. And, you know, all that, like, this is like Pilates on steroids. You don't want that. That's not Pilates. <laughs> okay. So the goal of Pilates is, you know, you're, again, you're moving slow and you're moving with a light spring to challenge your deep stabilizing muscles and connecting with your breath. So you're not pumping and shortening muscles, you, you can, you can add that athletic element in, but especially for someone that came into my studio and says, I have fibromyalgia. I'm like, okay, we're not going to do the athletic conditioning, right? So moving soft, moving slow with really light spring load. I do that a lot with people. I'll drop the intensity down and it's way more challenging because it's working your stabilizers. So I think that's one of the reasons Pilates would be really great for people in the fibro community and also even using things like bands so that 
again, you're not pumping iron, you're pressing into the band and then you're trying to go a little further and you're trying to go out a little further and you're getting that, that length again, right? You're elongating the muscle. That's what Pilates does. It lengthens the muscle through the strength. It's not shortening and con- tightening and contracting more. So um, I, I, it is 100%, I think, a wonderful um, form of exercise for the fibro community. Well, and that's where we try to distinguish and educate because we see we see the research or we hear from doctors to do certain things. And I know that we need to move our bodies, but we want to prevent injury and then also prevent high amounts of pain if we can. I know sometimes it's hard when we start moving, we might feel a little bit of it, but trying to distinguish between Pilates. And even when people talk about yoga, we've heard some people jump into straight like the hot yoga and then they all, we all pass out because we yes. half of us have pots. So we shouldn't yeah. be. <laughs> yeah. so it's well, like trying to find the middle ground. Up and down, up and down, going up and down too, right? I would 100% highly recommend a few things. I mean, doing your research on the instructor certification, interviewing the instructor, observing a class, asking them specifically how would they work with somebody with fibro, see if they they know their stuff, see if that resonates with you, observing. And um, even saying, you know, I just want to try out, can I just come in for 30 minutes of the class, you know, and just seeing how that feels to you. And not to be afraid, I have a couple of clients with POTS from um, long COVID. And it's like, okay, we, we do an exercise with lighter spring, we move a little slow, and then we relax for a minute. Okay, you feeling good? All right, let's move on to the next, right? Sometimes, unfortunately, with um, a lot of uh, trainers can be like, oh, I'm going to give you the hardest workout. And, you know, if you ask my clients, they're going to tell you I'm the hardest instructor they have. And it's not because I'm pumping them up with a ton of springs and making the exercise it's hard. It's because I insist on perfect form, the quality of movement. And that is really challenging. But the beauty of, of, and I think one of the most wonderful gifts of Pilates is it teaches you how to move your body efficiently and effectively where you walk, you should always walk out of here feeling longer and more energized and more centered. If you're feeling, and this is even just for my regular population, if you're walking out of here exhausted and you want to take a nap, then I didn't, I didn't do you justice because it's all about having functional strength to move. I'm like, okay, I'll ask, are are you going out for a pro football team? Are you training for the Olympics? No, okay. Well then let's talk about how we keep you moving with agility and grace and stability and mobility and confidence. And that's really what any good workout should do. So really talk to to your trainers before you jump into a class. I think that's a really great point and just important with emphasizing what type of movement they're trying to accomplish because some of us are not trying to run marathons or be athletes. We just want to lift up a laundry basket and be able to do laundry without feeling like our arms are going to fall off. So it's every day improving quality of life. And how do we do that with movement? And that's why we appreciate what you have to share. Yeah. And I would say too, you know, um, always start with like if you're doing some even arm work at home don't have any weights don't use any two or three pound weights don't put anything just you know if i have a client do this for 30 seconds but really feel the shoulder feel the back guess what you're engaging those muscles they're working right that that's all you need and like you said to be able to lift that laundry basket we don't have to <laughs> create more friction in the body. So always start super light. Always, always. Yeah. Or Marco said even making making the bed. So stuff like movements like that for daily routines can be challenging, but we know that we have to move. And again, we try to create these adaptations, but we might be putting us into service by our posture. Yes. Yes. Oh, yes. It, it's so... It's so, so true. So, you know, for example, let's, let's say somebody comes in with rounded shoulders. Which would be me. I'll be your perfect guinea pig. Right. And then you're like going to do some rows and you're doing this, right? You're pulling this way. Well, you're just making that worse. So it's like, first I try to get everyone, here's a good little thing to get your shoulder blades, right? Because most people are winging in their back. If you place your hands right on top of your head and lift your shoulders up into your ears and then let your shoulders go back. And then imagine your shoulder blades melting down the back of your rib. Now keep the shoulder blades exactly where they are. Open your arms out to the side 
and then let them flow down again. Try not to let the shoulder blades move. That'll generally get them nice and flat on the back of the rib cage, right? I'm not winging. Now, when I work with somebody, let's say I have them do a row. We only go to the place they can maintain that. If you're going to the place you're here, well, ouch, ouch, ouch. And again, it's not functional, right? We need to be able to get our body strong in neutral alignment first. But I will also say you can't just strengthen the back muscles to get your shoulders open. You have to first release the fascia and then strengthen. Otherwise, again, it's tug of war. And that's Mm -hmm. exhausting, especially with somebody with fibro. So roll, 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 roll. Ah, that's a big connection right there for anyone that's just jumped into like strength training without looking at all this aspect if you're in pain. Absolutely. Absolutely. And again, like we talked about earlier, if you're rolling and releasing, your body's sending in neutral, but now also your muscles can move in that full contraction and release. So it's going to feel stronger. You're setting yourself up better. If you're so tight and they're just going like this. Imagine how exhausting that gets really quick. It's like all of a sudden, right? If you're looking at this and I talked about how when you inhale, that's how your lungs should feel, right? Now, if you're breathing like that, you're getting how many breaths a minute, right? But now let's say you're breathing like this. <laughs> just one little part. And it's re- like the whole system's like, oh my gosh, I'm exhausted, right? So yeah, super important. Well, you have been a wealth of knowledge. Just a shout out to Dr. Ron and the team at Texas Center for Lifestyle Medicine to, for connecting us together. I missed the opportunity of seeing you in person, but it, we definitely have to make it happen in 2024 to take a class. Maybe we can help you set up a, a fibro tour workshop over there in Colorado. That would be fun. Yeah, we should, t- we should set that up. I love, I love empowering people to feel better. When I can see someone's meter and their quality of life move, the sparkle in their eye just fills my heart. I love being able to help. Well, you've definitely empowered me with these uh, orbs. I'm I'm definitely using them. So wonderful. Well, and I'll share with you, I'll, you know, email you maybe the couple specials that I'm going to offer your fibro community if they they want to take advantage of any of that as well. Yeah, I I know that people would love that because this information is stuff that you can invest in, you can do it at home, which is important. We're empowering people because sometimes mobility or even transportation becomes an issue, especially in remote areas. Um, we, We do tap into that system. So leaving us today with all our fibromyalgia friends, what's ahead for 2024 for you? Ah, I know. Can you believe it's uh, 2024? I know. know. I'm hosting um, a retreat um, in Costa Rica in March. So I'm like my mind come January's turning a little bit towards getting that set up. But, you know, just bringing this fascia work to more places, offering more more workshops, connecting with more communities, because I mean, it, it, there's so many people that that need this help. And again, just making it accessible. So um, yeah, I'm gonna, like you said, kind of look out beyond the road, try to come wherever people are willing to invite me in and helping them out. 